last year. Uh, we welcome you all to our, our campus here. Um, we expected a full room because this thing has been sold out. But I guess when something's sold out for free, it, the people uh, people are less anxious to get there at least on time anyway. So welcome. And uh, we have our uh, first uh, speaker and our first presentation. And uh, you, you can all read his, his uh, hand. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Michael Shear, the President 98. I'm going to give a talk today, uh, this morning, called Privacy is Dying and It's Your Fault. <coughs> and I mean all of you, and me too. This is me. Uh, I run my own business called Leverage Consulting and Associates. I spent almost nine years in the United States Navy doing uh, electronic countermeasures. Uh, in the air and then on the ground with the Army. Um, founding member of the Church of Wi-Fi and unallocated space, father of four, and the husband of my wife. Sometime during the next hour, she's going to call because every time I give her a presentation, she calls during the presentation. Two years in a row at DEF CON, speaking in front of a thousand people, my wife decides to call during the presentation. So I have my phone right here. I'm waiting for it because it will happen. Not planned. It will just happen. I started a blog called The Assault on Privacy, which is a, a blog about um, talking about government intrusions into privacy rights. And mostly it was just compiling articles from all over the country. And honestly, because there's so, much prob there's so many problems, the blog, it was so difficult to run because there's just too much going on. So what I did is the blog's still there, but there's I don't really instead of just pointing to the articles, I just post them everything on a Twitter account. So there's a Twitter account that's called AOP Blog, um, and you can follow that. And I post the same articles. I just instead of posting them on a blog, I post them on a Twitter account. I've been doing this for about a year and a half now. So I tell you who I am, and but most people don't tell you. This, so people tell you who they are. And then that's supposed to be like why you should listen to that person because they're an expert or whatever. I also like to put this slide on, and this is why you should this is why you should be skeptical of what I have to say. I'm going to talk a lot about constitutional rights, uh, Fourth Amendment. Okay, why you should be skeptical? Well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer. I didn't go to law school. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, anybody's presentation, like mine, is going to be biased by their own beliefs. So everything that I built here today is based upon my beliefs. Now, I'm not trying to persuade you one way or the other to believe something, but that's just the way it is. My education, my background, that's how I grew up. So unintentionally, intentionally, that's the way my presentation is going to be. It's not a political presentation, but I'm going to talk a lot about politics today, political issues. I'm going to actually talk about a little bit about elections today. I'm not talking about specific political issues, abortion, death penalty, whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about politics in terms of elections and information and things like that. But of course, the things I talk about will be influenced by political issues. It's unavoidable. The bottom line of why you should be skeptical, don't take my word for it. Uh, at the end of this presentation, there's a source slide that has all the sources of all the articles and everything else that I used to put this presentation together. If you think something I said is BS, go read the article and you know come to your own conclusion. OK, so um, privacy is dying, and it's your fault. At DEF CON, I spent 10 minutes going through ten, uh, a thousand years of history of, of, of the history of privacy. Ten year, uh, a thousand years in 10 minutes. And I'm not even going to do that here because I don't have time because this is, I, I made this presentation into something else. So what we're going to talk about today is the right to privacy. What is it? Where does it come from? So I have two, slot, two history slides for you. Like I said, at DEF CON, I actually talked about all this stuff. I'm not even going to talk about it today because there's just no time for it. But everything goes back to um, the Magna Carta and before even the Vine Right of Kings. There's a whole bunch of different cases, uh, the English Bill of Rights, different cases in England and in the colonies. Um, and again, all, this, all, all these slides will be available so you can see all this stuff. 
uh, or getting the Declaration of Rights, state constitutions, constitutional conventions of the states, constitution ratifying conventions, the Bill of Rights, all the way up to the 14th Amendment, all these things have some impact on what we call today the right to privacy. Now, of course, you look in the Constitution, your Bill of Rights, where's the right to privacy? Well, it's not there. So that's why, you know, we go into all this stuff. So there's my history lesson for you. We've covered a thousand years of history. And there's three concepts that I want to bring out to you when we talk about privacy, um, which ultimately gets mostly put into the Fourth Amendment. The, the three historical concepts are reasonableness. In other words, for the government to intrude into your privacy, it has to be a reasonable intrusion. But what does that mean? Don't know what it means. Reasonable is said to be perhaps the most litigated word in the, in the, in the English language because what's reasonable? Well, I don't know what's reasonable, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The second key historical concept is the idea of warrants. And the idea is, um, if you want to invade someone's privacy, you have to get a warrant. Prior to uh, the establishment of the Bill of Rights, there was something called general warrants took place in the colonies and in England. A general warrant was the king basically said, I don't like this guy because he's writing publications that I don't like. Um, here's an open-ended warrant. Anytime you see this guy, feel free to you know shake, shake him down, go through his things. Anything you find that's not, you know, kosher, lock him up or whatever. It was a general warrant. It wasn't, spe it wasn't specific to a time or a place or anything. And as long as the king was alive, the, the warrant existed. So that gets into our third key historical concept, which is the idea of particularity. And that is, as you read the Fourth Amendment, we'll see later, that a warrant has to specify what the, what the police are looking for. We're looking for these items related to this crime. Um, we, the warrant has to be served at a certain time. You can't kick down the door without saying, hey, police, we're here to serve a search warrant, whatever, that sort of thing. So the, all, all three of these um, are the three historical concepts that get built into the Fourth Amendment. The one that we're going to talk about today the most is reasonableness. So R2, reasonable expectation of privacy. This phrase right here will define every Fourth Amendment case that you ever read about. And we'll talk about one that was uh, argued just this week, perhaps the most important Fourth Amendment case in at least a decade. There was another case that was just decided yesterday. Some of you may have been following the Twitter WikiLeaks case involving Jake Applebaum and a whole bunch of other people. Um, uh, a grand jury in Virginia uh, asked for a certain Twitter account information related to Jake Applebaum and a few other people. Um, and we'll talk about that case because that, again, involves reasonable expectation of privacy or lack thereof. So here's the text of the Fourth Amendment. And I highlighted, the th or I bolded the things that I said were the three historical concepts. So the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. So there's our unreasonable unre requirement. Shall not be violated. No warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and, particular, and particularly, there's our particularity requirement, describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So we have our unreasonable or reasonable test, we have our warrants, and we have the particularity requirement. But read it, think, think about what also this says. We're secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. What does that mean? That also means that it is possible that there could be searches that are reasonable and therefore don't apply here. So not every search or not every intrusion into your privacy requires a warrant. That's where that's a very important distinction to be made here. So the, de the determination between reasonable and unreasonable is going to determine whether or not a warrant is required. Okay, so let me go back. Here's the Fourth Amendment. It's, it's kind of a run-on sentence, but it's one sentence, right? So that's pretty, you know, okay, we got it, right? This is page one of three of a law school um, diagram on understanding the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, I can't even read it from here. I know you can't read it from there. This is all about the Fourth Amendment and the different exceptions and what applies and all sorts of things. Uh, Let's see. 
dealing with arrests, searches, and seizures. If, uh, if you have a valid search warrant, what if the search warrant is not valid, but what if they thought it was valid? Um, all sorts of things. I mean, exceptions to the, to the a warrant requirement, uh, exigent circumstances, all sorts of things. Again, this is page one of three. Uh, it's not even required to show the other three. But, okay, so we take this, and there's a lot of stuff that is extraneous here that doesn't apply most of the time. There are just very few chances that it will apply. And we dumb it down into this, which is a little bit more understandable. So this is, this is about as simple as you can make the Fourth Amendment in terms of a, a diagram. So we start up in the top. Was the search performed by the government? Okay, this is very important because the Fourth Amendment talks about search your right to privacy from searches, but it's from the government. So if your neighbor kicks down your door, your Fourth Amendment hasn't been violated by your neighbor because your neighbor's not, the, unless your neighbor's a cop or something like that, but na your neighbor's not the government. So the search has actually been performed by the government. So that could be local police, federal, state, whatever, but it has to be the government. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? There's different circumstances here. We'll talk about that. And this is what we're going to talk about the most today. For example, when you're outside versus when you're inside, you're in a car uh, versus in your house, uh, whether you have items in a backpack versus you're just holding them, that sort of thing. When we get into digital information, content, content data versus non-content data, was there a warrant? No or yes. There's exceptions to warrants. You see all up there. Again, I'm not going to go through this whole thing because we're not going to talk mostly about all of that. We're going to talk about here a reasonable expectation of privacy. So the key questions from the previous slide onto this slide. Was the action performed by the government? Was there a warrant? Was the warrant proper? The key question for us today is, is there a reasonable expectation of privacy? Okay. A government intrusion into your privacy only constitutes a search when there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. Otherwise, it's not a search, even if you're being searched. I know that doesn't make sense, but the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. So let's give an example. Um, you are um, a suspect in a uh, uh, whatever sort of investigation. They don't know anything about you other than that we, we, we suspect you might be doing something. And there's a cop sitting outside your house and every time you come out they just mark down um, left the house at this time and uh, drove to Walmart whatever. Now is that a search? Probably not. Why? Because once you step outside your house in the public you don't really have a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? You can't assume that people can't watch you when you're outside. So if you're, even though your sort of privacy is maybe being violated a little bit, it's an acceptable intrusion because you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in public. In this case, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. The expectation of pri reasonable expectation of privacy is broken into two parts. It's a two-part test. The first is an actual expectation of privacy. So that is, for example, I'll use this example later. You go, in, you go into a phone booth, you close the door of the phone booth, you get close to the phone, you cover, your hand, you cover the mouthpiece with your hand, and you're talking very low into the phone. Do you have a reasonable expectation? Do you have an actual expectation of privacy in that circumstance? So the first is how it applies to you. Well, clearly, you close the door in the phone booth, you're talking low, you have an, an actual expectation of privacy. The second part of that test is, does society as a whole view your expectation as reasonable? So for all of you, if someone walks into a phone booth and closes the door and sort of puts their hand over and talks very slowly, do you presume that that person has a reasonable expectation of privacy in their conversation? Most people will say yes. So in this test, one, we had an actual expectation of privacy, and two, 
society believes that expectation to be reasonable. Therefore, that person has an expectation of privacy. If you want to violate their privacy, you require a warrant. This is a two-part test, and it's also a test that requires both variables to be true. If either one of these variables is not true, the test fails. If you walk outside and you scream something to your neighbor and and someone else say say you walk outside and you scream some racially charged thing to your neighbor and someone happened to be videotaping it and they put it up on YouTube and you say you know what I was in my front yard I have a reasonable expectation of privacy um, well you might have an expectation of privacy but most people would say you're in your front yard you're yelling you don't have it your expectation is not reasonable therefore your privacy wasn't violated does that make sense So here's the example, the phone booth. We don't really have phone booths like this anymore. And that's probably from, from the UK, but most of our phone booths are just those little things. It's not even, you don't even have a door anymore, but. What about in a park? If you're walking around having a conversation with someone in a park. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that conversation? Probably not. The opening scene, there's a movie in 1974 called The Conversation, made by Francis Ford Coppola, starring Gene Hackman. And the opening scene, there's a couple walking around Union Square in San Francisco. And, Gene, and unbeknownst to the couple, Gene Hackman and his team are recording the conversation from different areas. And uh, a good example of, even though they're sort of talking, you know, they're, being, they're close to each other, they're just having a conversation in a crowded square, they don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in those circumstances. What about inside your home? The home is, is perhaps the, the strongest expectation of privacy. When you're in your home, you know, there's a, a warrant required for that to be violated. What about when you go through the naked scanner at the airport? This is a good one because a lot of people will say the first part of the test, expectation of privacy, yes. I have an actual expectation of privacy. The problem with that test is the second part, is the, the society, or the society find that reasonable? And right now, society says it's reasonable. So there's also issues with, what's, with what uh, is called an administrative search, and we'll get into that later. But that's why that test, that, that search right there is considered reasonable and not a violation of the Fourth Amendment, according to current doctrine. So we talked about your home. What about your trash? Well, um, if your trash is inside your fence up against your house, that's considered part of the cartilage of your home and it's protected. Once you put your trash out on the curb, you're basically saying, I've consented for someone else to take my trash away. If someone goes through your trash when it's on the curb, you have no expectation of privacy in, that, in, that, in whatever's in your trash anymore. What about dipsy dumpsters on company property? A uh, what dumpster? The big dumpsters like you see outside most uh, corporate buildings and stuff. If it's on private property, it depends on it depends on the location really. If it's if it's technically on property, but it's like right next to an area that's easily accessible by the public. But if it's behind a building, I mean, it depends the circumstances. Yeah. Is there a distinction between private carding companies and uh, public? It doesn't matter in the circumstances here. I mean, once you, one. What I'm saying is, if you're turning over your uh, refuse to a specific individual for their custody, does that now become public? It's public once you put it on the curb. I'm not talking about on the curb. I'm talking about a private commercial firm that picks up commercial waste and promises to dispose of it on private property. I don't know. Fair enough. I don't know either. I. I, I I do know that once the trash hits the curb, there's no expectation once, of privacy. Yes, once it hits the curb, especially for public collection, there's no point in an agency of the state anyway. Even if it's a private company, I don't think it matters. It might matter. Maybe. It might matter because there is the question of custody of the property. You can go to jail for putting trash in someone else's receptacle if it's a private company because of the ownership issue and the rights and that. It's interesting. What about a backpack? What if you have something in your backpack? Generally, when something's inside of a container, things that are inside the container have an expectation of privacy. So, um, 
you're walking down the street with your backpack. The cop decides that you might have, he has no suspicion at all that you have anything, but he wants to, he just decides he wants to see in your backpack. Well, first of all, he can't do that anyway, but if he, if he found something in your backpack and he had no suspicion to look in it, that evidence, any evidence should be thrown out, should be thrown out. Can I ask you this? Yes. What if uh, it's uh, a high alert type uh, situation, suspected? Uh... There still has to be specific evidence that you, it, it pertains to you. In other words, there has to be, it doesn't have to be probable cause, it can be just, there, can, there has to be something beyond a hunch. Once they stop you, they can search your entire person, specifically for weapons. But it has to be, but it has to be, they have to have a reason, to, they have stop have a reason to stop you. But the reason for stopping you in the first place is reasonable suspicion. Right, it can, it can be, be nothing more than you're walking around looking aimlessly like you're right. going to be. It could be like we saw so your pocket was bulging and we thought you had a weapon. No, it's even easier than that. They could decide that you look lost, they could decide that you look confused, they could do that whole altered mind state. The suspicion of drug use. It's this is not a serious uh, barrier. To yeah, stop. it's not difficult. And, and if you put your backpack down and walk away from it for a sure. moment, maybe not intended, then is that enough for reasonable suspicion? Right. What about what about these? A lot of some schools now require these clear backpacks. What about you have something in a container but it's clear? I, I don't even want to go here because you're like, it's a container but it's clear, so. It's more of just a mind bender for you. Like, do you remember when um, the sniper incident was going on down near DC? They were stopping every single car and searching every car. Yeah. And that that was like a whole issue back then too. But nobody said anything because it was such public security no, no, issue. No, because it's not an issue at all. The, the right, the, the press doctrine doesn't tell you to talk. You don't have the right to put uh, uh, privacy in your vehicle on the public roads. So the minute you're in a public vehicle, they can stop you. Uh, they yeah. still, yes, there has to be a reason to stop you. But the reason is reasonable suspicion. And the other For, thing you need to know is if they do a state, a, a drug uh, interdiction or a drug driving interdiction or anything that's not discriminatory to the individual, you can stop everybody. They can do that. They can say that's true. at any time. So this is what they've got, this is how they've gotten around that little problem. They don't say if they have a suspicion of an individual, they can stop everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were doing that already. And they, they, the TSA has now started that in Tennessee and some other places where they're stopping they're stopping vehicles now on the highway. Yeah, that's, 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 that went away 